Hello, Global Gardeners. It's Monday. It's time to start your gardening week live. Don't you just love this time? I want to point out, because last couple of weeks I've had my background and it's been snow covered in my garden, but we've had warm weather and my snow is melting. I might actually be able to get outside and get some of my gardening chores done today. What a concept. So nice to have everybody here. Shout out to Heidi and Jay, our fantastic moderators and Today's show, as I promised over the last couple of weeks, is going to be special because I have another guest on the show today. And so the, the underlying theme today is when you get to a certain age, after you've had a career and you haven't been a gardener, what do you do? If you have any interest at all, I suggest that you... Look for Kay Cottrell, the late bloomer. Hi, Kay. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm so happy to be here. We we talked about this for like last year sometime, like six months ago or something. And I didn't follow through. And so now I'm I'm here. Thank well, and, and I gotta give I gotta give thanks to uh uh Charles at Ivy Organics for you know yeah. connecting us. Yeah. So for those of you that don't know, Ivy Organics uh, does a thing, a few things. I, I had an Instagram a couple of weeks ago. I was painting my my trees with the, the white paint that Ivy Organics produces. And I also use their their fertilizers and doing the potting soil mixes that I make. And so Charles at our Ivy Organics has a number of gardeners like me and Kay that help out by getting the word out. And he gets us together every now and then on a Zoom call with all these different gardeners. And that's that's how you and I met was was on a Zoom call. Hi, Ken. <laughs> I just happened to see Ken there. Oh, uh, nice. yeah, I know. And, uh, you know, Charles, I met through someone else in, in L.A. and and did videos with him there and. And then this, you know, affiliate program uh, developed and we both got in there and. You know, there's some really great people in that group. Like Scott Head. Scott like Head. Like Scott is, Head, there he is. <laughs> there he is. So, so glad that you could you could make the the show. Uh, I saw that you had come early, Scott. So always nice to have you here. And River and Good Dale, morning. it's a holiday, so Riverdale Gardens, nice to see you here. Good morning. And uh, lots of lots of people checking in. And so I had mentioned to Kay that we have people from all over the world. So Boothby Gardens is in East Ontario. Wow. And, and uh, of course, lots of people from all around the, the U.S., but I'll go ahead and um, highlight any of those foreign people that are staying up late at night to watch us. That's always <laughs> nice. And so, Kay, my, I actually... My friend, uh, my friend uh, is Marley One is here. I just texted him. <laughs> Oh, nice. He's the one I just visited, just did a live stream with him last week. Nice. And so uh, that we we have people from all over the place, um, uh, including uh, Europe. And uh, nice to see that Rick is here, who's watching from Australia. Nice. And Two Gardens Homestead is from London. Wow. And, so, and then, of course, we've got... Uh, places like Palazzo Place in South Florida, and Catherine is in Raleigh, North Carolina. So uh, as we talk, just, just to let you know, uh, there's a lot of people from all over, and we're all gardeners, and we're all interested in uh, what you have to say, of course. I first saw you probably 10 years ago, and as I was getting started with uh, the YouTube thing. And I was at a school garden at the time and trying to learn more and more about gardening. I watched your channel. And back then you were in California, Southern California. So let's, let's start with that, that you had a career and you and I have talked a little bit about this, but I, you know, I would like you to share with others how you transitioned from the working world to becoming a gardener and deciding that you wanted to, to then share your journey on YouTube. 
Well, YouTube was, I think my channel, I actually started my channel in 2007 because everyone said, Kay, you're an actor. You've got to have a channel on YouTube. And I thought, well, what am I going to do? I mean, what, what does that mean? You know, I don't, I don't even know if I posted any content between 2007 till I started Late Bloomer. And I thought, well, since I already have a channel, I'll just put it on the Kay Cottrell channel. And, but I had this really long name and Kay Cottrell late bloomer urban organic gardening show or something. It was just, it was just like so long you couldn't even. <laughs> so, but anyway, I uh, transitioning from the working world. Well, see when you're an actor and you're not lucky enough to be uh, a lead on a show, which means you're working all the time. Uh, you're just working here and there and you're running off to an audition and you are just balancing raising children and, and doing all of that. So uh, for me, it wasn't like I stopped that and I started this. Uh, I just, my son, my younger son was in Waldorf, the Waldorf school. And there was a biodynamic farmer uh, who made compost for a, uh, a big ranch in Malibu from horse manure. And uh, he was, teaching a, a little workshop at my son's school. Cause you know, Waldorf is very experiential kind of school. And so I went in there and when I saw him, they were actually doing a vortex making compost tea from this, this um, biodynamic charged um, compost. And so I thought, well, gee, that's interesting. And we had a conversation. I don't know how it, I got from point A to point B, but he said, to me about my yard. I just had this tiny front yard and he said, plant two fruit trees, two citrus trees and surround them with nasturtium and herbs. And so I did. And as soon as I did that, I was like off to the races. I was, I fell in love immediately. I had, you know, my entire, since I left home and we didn't garden at my house, my mother had bushes and things, mm -hmm. but she grew up on a farm, very, very poor. Uh, and my father, uh, grew up on a farm. His, his father had a business, a Chevrolet dealership, but he also farmed. He had a small dairy. So we had the benefit of all of that wonderful food from grandparents that only lived within 20 minutes or an hour and a half away. So I had that background. And as soon as I started planting anything, seeds, I, I was just, I was like hooked because, you know, you go to college, you're not gardening. I, you go off and live your life as a young person. You're not gardening. You, 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 and then I went to New York, a succession of big cities, apartments, you know, and lived in Manhattan and as an actor pursuing acting, went to seven years in, in New York and then 32 years. I can't believe it was that long, but it was 32 years in LA. And at some point, uh, uh, 25 years ago, 26, seven years ago, we bought this house and it had a very small front yard. I never even thought about doing anything other than planting a flower or bush or something. But when I met him, I said, oh, I can have oranges and, and uh, lemons in my front yard. Yeah. And it just, it just took off. I, I fell in love. And I, I believe I tapped into this subconscious from my grandparents. I never had the advantage of, you know, they were dead. Uh, long before I ever even imagined becoming a gardener. And so I, I literally had so little space to deal with. I had this, um, it, it, in, in Australia, it's called the verge. Okay. And, um, but it's this little strip between the, the little road. It, we were on a small street and the sidewalk and it was six and a half feet. I measured, I had a six and a half by 20 foot section. And then the driveway split it. And then the six and a half by 14 foot section on the end. So I knew exactly how many, many square feet I had about 200 square feet altogether. And uh, so then I added pots and I just kept adding and adding, and adding till the whole place was just a jungle. Nice. And I, I couldn't, I could not get enough. And, and, but, nice. it, but in 2012, you know, people, people encouraged me to get on to YouTube and, and do a YouTube channel. And uh, so there wasn't a lot to, to look at in 2012, early 2012, but I had had the benefit, as I just mentioned before, that, that I had booked a national commercial 
uh, was an insurance thing uh, in 2011. And then I booked a, an American Airlines national spot in 2012. So I had residuals. And so I, coming from an entertainment background, I wanted to make a show, a pretty little show with, you know, at that time, shorter the better, five to six minutes yep. was tops for length. And I wanted it just to be a beautiful little package with animation and music and editing and sound editing and like, you know, like you would want to if you, you came from the business, you know. And so all of that ended when YouTube changed in 2016 and I began to do vlogs and they were longer and I couldn't afford to pay people. <laughs> yeah. And the residuals ran out. So I said, you know, I got to do everything by, by myself. So I'd already been through this major transition with my channel. And then in uh, 2019, I had to sell my house. And uh, so I had to decide, am I going into an apartment in LA? A am I gonna go? My brother said to come back home to Tennessee. My mother is here, she's in a facility. And so I decided to buy property here. That was a big process. And so I tried to just cover, um, I, I tried to use my channel to just cover the challenges of, you know, major transition later in life. Uh, and I, for a while I was in an apartment in, in Santa Monica, just growing out of containers and getting a lot of views. And then I transitioned to become a, becoming a homesteader. And there were yeah. so many challenges and I'm not handy with tools like you are. So, um, so I, I know you, I'm probably talking too long, but I, okay. I was well, watching your video this morning about, is it worth it? Yeah. And I do want to talk about that, but go ahead. Yeah. So the, I, I think this is important. This is why I wanted to have you on and, and talk about this because a substantial portion of my viewers are older. They are trying to figure out if they should start, how they should start. And I think your example of just a couple citrus, citrus trees in the front yard surrounded by herbs is, is perfect for showing that you have no experience. You really aren't sure if you even know what you're doing. And then you do just a little bit and you're hooked. And then you add more and then you add more. And and so the move to Tennessee, oh. once you became a gardener, did you look for property? And did you have that that intent that the, that you're going to set up a homestead? And because your channel has changed dramatically. It used to be very educational, nothing but here's how you do things. And your older videos are still worth watching for everybody who, who wants to see it. But now it's, it's more Kay's journey on the homestead. And you're showing all the things that you're having to deal with getting the homestead set up and managing it and getting things to grow. So was that your intent when you moved to Tennessee? Well, I always wanted more space. Everybody, even back when I was, you know, I was, I never had enough space. I was even thinking about trying to grow on my roof, on my house. <laughs> it's just too dangerous. And I'm just going, you know, I always wanted more space. So when it, it, it became clear uh, that I was going to come to Tennessee and try to find a place, I looked all year. I mean, I put offers on two other houses uh, that, that didn't have, great garden area, one of them. And so I was always thinking I've got to have a garden area, but you know, things in our world have changed so much since 2020. And that was a big influence on me. Uh, I thought, okay, I'm on my own now. I need to uh, be as prepared as I possibly can. So I want a water source. I want wood heat. Oh, you can't see it. <laughs> uh, I want, um, there was, there were certain things that I absolutely had to have. And it was a time, it was the year after there was a big tornado that hit Nashville. And, and they said, if you can find a contractor that's not busy, they're not any good. And so I thought I have to buy a house that's livable, that I can move in and live there so I can get to work on the garden. And the, the, the beauty of, of this place, although it's not ideal for gardening by any means, but it did, the previous owners had, I think there were six, five raised beds out there and everything, I'm on a hill. So they had, they had just put the wood with the hill and they weren't level. So oh, when you were at the top end, you felt like you were falling down the hill. If you, if you, 
<laughs> if you were trying to garden. So I said, okay, those have to be rebuilt. And so you, as soon as I got here, I thought, well, what can I do? What is the best place to start? And that was the raised beds because there was already an idea for them here. And as I say, I still have this on my, on my website for anybody who's really starting out. There's an, I think it's 18 pages or anyway, it's a free download. If you subscribe to my website at latebloomershow.com and it's, and it's how, you know, 10 steps to a great first garden. And one of the things I talk about is the sun. Now I see in your garden, you didn't have to worry about that because you had a it's big open sun. blank space and the sun is everywhere. But when you're, when you're someplace like here, I'm, I'm kind of in a, a bowl. There's a, a big hill over there and there's a big hill behind me. So where's the sun going to hit on what I have to use out here? I've got a forest back here, but I'm not going to start taking down all those trees and trying to do a terrace terrace thing. I'm going to deal with what was already mowed. And I had barefoot farmer. I don't know if anybody knows who he is, but he's kind of famous in Tennessee because he never wears shoes, even in the winter. And even, even on the tractor, he does not wear shoes. I did an interview with him uh, some years ago, came from California to interview him. And uh, he, I actually had him come over as a consultant and he said, your best soil is down there because over the years, you know, everything goes down the hill. And so I've got more rock on the hill and better soil sitting in that kind of middle at the lower garden. Now, Daryl, my friend Daryl will tell you that, uh, you know, you want to have your garden next to your house, but if your best soil is, is 200, 250 feet away, you, that's what you have to do. You know, so as I as I went along, I I I solved problems. Uh, I fixed things, had things fixed. I'm not good with tools, had things fixed, had to hire people to do everything. So uh, fortunately, I felt like I had the money to do that. And I thought it was very it's very important for me at this age not to be in debt. Yeah. And that's a, a that was a big one, you know. I, I didn't want to take out a mortgage or anything. So I wanted to be able to buy a place that I could pay for and then just start solving the problems. And so the, since there was a, a lay a, a blueprint kind of for where the sun was and the raised beds, that's where I started. And, and that's, I'm glad you said it that way because I think a lot of gardeners, especially new to gardening and, and especially if they're retiring and they think, oh, I've always wanted a big garden. I'm going to put in a big garden. And they've never gardened before. And they don't take that time. That's that's very important to take the time, look at the sun. And yeah, especially if you have an expert that can come in and advise you on soil, that is, it's better to put the garden 200 feet away where it's good soil and full sun than to put it outside your back door with terrible soil and no sun. And you might not even know that mm -hmm. until you spend the time. When I first moved in here, I spent six months just observing, just paying attention to animals that might come in the, the yard, what the weather patterns were, how intense the sun was. I've got a shed and house that, that will throw shade. And so it is important to to start figuring out well ahead of time before you put that first bed in and not be, I'm so glad you said you were willing to hire people because I think a lot of people think I don't have the skills, so I just won't do it. And yeah. the answer is have somebody else do it for you. Well, yeah, at, at my, you know, in, at my age, I have to, uh, but I was going to point out, this is, this is, so, you know, this is when you're, you're thinking the micro garden and I, I'm sure a lot of people can relate to this. So in my tiny front yard in, in California, I, uh, when I started gardening, it was November. And so the sun, let's see. So, so the house set this way, I forget, let's see, the, the, the sun came up over there and it went down over there. So it net, wait, it, yeah, in, in July, the sun would go over the house like that. And then it went 
down over that way the rest of the year. It never came over this way. So if yes. the house is facing this way, the sun was here in the summer, and then in the winter it's over here. So the house and the and the trees in between our lots and and the big house they put next door sh shadowed uh, shaded my front yard. So I thought, well, all I can have is a tree that sticks up to catch some of that sun. I, I, don't, I can't, you know. But then, <laughs> but then I sat out there. I, I, I created this cozy corner. I called it a cozy corner. It was under one of the trees and I, I put a little shade cloth because, you know, it's California. So you've always got sun and, and yeah. warmth. And so I sat out there and I studied the light hitting that small front yard. And I determined that in the summer, I had another extra six feet. And so I put in a six by 10 foot raised bed in the spot where I thought I can't grow anything because there's no sun in the winter. And then in the winter, I, uh, when there was no sun hitting the ground, I had cloth pots uh, with, with all the brassicas sitting on that raised bed. And so they're now up this high. And then, you know, the broccoli's up th this high off the ground and it's catching the light. So it's like you, you, you can really figure things out when you have a very small space. Where's the Absolutely. light? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and the willingness and the desire, of course, that, yeah. that a six by 10 bed in your front yard, most people wouldn't even think of that as a garden, but now you're harvesting your vegetables for dinner. I grew, the whole thing was full of corn one year. It was just, it was like eight feet tall just right there in the front yard, three steps out the, out of the front door. Nice. It was amazing. Now I have all this space. And, uh, and so it, it just, it requires help. Sure. So, but I have this, I have this un, insatiable, insatiable desire to grow more and more and more. And I, I noticed in your, in your video where you're, you're talking about, is it worth it? And you were, you were judging the prices of squash and tomatoes and all the basics, the things people eat. You know beans and all of that, but you know I met early on. I met um, Jack Davis in uh, Phoenix. Well, she contacted me. It's like the second year of my channel, or maybe it was the first. And I started making trips to Phoenix. Well, you see all the things they can grow in Phoenix, and you go back to LA and you go, I want to grow every one, fig trees and and moringa and. Um, uh, Roselle. And I, I fell in love with all of these wonderful plants. Nice. They don't ne necessarily fill you up like a 20 pound squash is going to fill you up, but I, it's just part of why I do it. I just absolutely love it. So I have my Moringa seeds here. Good, good. There we go. <laughs> and, and I have Stevia. I, I was able to grow that one time in, uh, in California and you know, uh, I, I want to grow so many things, yeah. you know? Well, that's, that's, you've got, you know, you've got the bug and that's what happens is you get the bug. I grew Moringa last year just to you see did? if I could, I started it from seed indoors under lights. It got to be about a foot and a half, two feet tall. Um, but, uh, I, and I put it outside for a brief period, but I of course can't grow it outside here in Colorado is just too cold, but it, but I, I fully know what you're talking about. It's, you got to do it. You got to try it. You got to see if you can say, yes, I've grown Moringa and I didn't use it for anything, but at least I knew that I could grow it. And, and I think that's an important aspect. Well, um, you know, something you think of as, as something that would grow in Asia. I, I was in Vancouver, well, three times for the, for a web <laughs> festival. This was back when Late Bloomer was, uh, well, 2016, 17, 15, 16, 17. And I actually won best, uh, best reality series in, in 2017, I think. But while there, they had, they had a store, uh, I, I, is it called Granville or something? I forget now, it's been a while. But there's a place down on the water that that's all arts, district and that's where the festival was and there was a shop and in there they had some interesting things and i bought some indigo seeds okay which you know you you make dye out of blue yeah. dye 
And I thought, oh, this is so cool. I really want to do this. But I never got around to doing it in California. Never had the time. And uh, or, I mean, space, space in California and time here. And and so I thought, well, that's never going to grow in Tennessee. You know, I had thought about that in the last year. I thought, eh, I still got those, those uh, indigo seats, you know. Last night on YouTube, I saw a short video and the people were, were in Canada and um, selling indigo uh, seeds. And I thought, so they're growing it in Canada. Canada. <laughs> so, so I'm going, if they can grow in Canada, I can grow it here. You know, so now I'm intrigued. I've got to go see if I can find them, you know. Nice. Uh, so I have a question from Serena. I'm setting up two new beds that pop up and one has sections. The other is just round with no compartments. When I mix the gardening mix for the beds, how do I add worms? Now, have you ever added worms to your bed or beds? Are you talking to me? Yes. You're talking to her. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. I did that all the time in California. I bought worms. And I uh, and then I also started uh, growing them in worm towers. But it, just to answer her question, you simply just dump them on dump them on the soil, and they 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 go where they want to go all through it. Yeah. Now yeah. I, I will say uh, I haven't done that because the worms that you typically buy, Serena, are red wiggler worms. Yeah. And they cannot survive cold weather. So for mm. Southern California, where it's nice and warm yeah. most of the year, you could add worms. But for those of us that actually have real winters with snow and frozen ground, you can add the worms at any time of year, but they are going to die during the winter. So my approach has always been to amend the soil well, and my native worms that can survive the winter will find the beds. And, you know, and Tennessee, of course, has a lot of worms. I'm sure you've got a lot of native worms that are rolling through your garden. I had so many worms down in my lower garden where the soil is good, uh, where I planted tomatoes last year. It was, I was going to ask you, and by the way, I just wanted to give a shout out to Devonese Ball. She's here. And Devonese is a pastor in Ohio, and she is doing a, uh, a a day next Saturday. I don't know if you're going to be able to. It's going to be able to be live, but she is going to the into the churches and try to uh, teach people to grow their own food. Nice. So she's nice. starting this whole thing. So uh, I'm going to be part of that um, by awesome. by Zoom. But I was just wondering, could you take your could you take some of excavate some of your Colorado worms and grow them out so you had a whole lot like in your shop or something where it's not as cold in a in a tub? I've done so many. Yeah, and so I actually have a video about this, and I'm sure Jay Jay Dixon's really good when I mention something. She'll pop up a link um, pretty oh, soon. Oh, good. Um, but there are three different kinds of worms, and so the worms live at different depths in the yeah. soil. And so the red wigglers are the type of worm that lives at the surface. And they they typically don't burrow more than three or four inches deep. Mm. And that's why they won't survive the winters, because they can't burrow down. The other two types of worms that will burrow much deeper into the soil, they eat different materials than those composting worms do. So they're migratory. They are moving many feet every day eating the organisms in the soil more than they eat the actual decaying vegetation in the soil. And so if you try to capture those worms and put them in a bin, they they won't eat what you give them and uh -huh. they'll die. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And so that's why the the native worms that are surviving the winter and moving throughout the landscape, they'll come into the beds and eat some of the decaying vegetation. But it's those those small worms that you can buy that are actually focusing on eating nothing but the decaying vegetation. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I've had a number of people saying, I, I got dug up a bunch of worms and put them in a bin and they all died. What happened? Well, it's because it's just a different type of worm and they don't survive in bins. So I have a question. Scott, so if you, uh, I have put, <laughs> I have so many weeds that come up 
through the uh, raised beds mm -hmm. that last year, they just choked out the strawberries, had to take everything out. I mean, granted, I could have stayed on top of it, but I didn't. Uh, everything came out and I said, this year I'm going to put, I'm going to line the bed from, and they're taller now. So they, the lining goes like that all the way across and all the way up. But now I can't have worms in there unless I put them in there. Yes. So, and that would be, that would be a, a good example of a situation where I would add worms, at least even here in Colorado, knowing that the native worms can't get into the bed because of the barrier that adding worms, even though I know they're going to die, oh. that's a cheaper way. Worm castings actually cost a lot of money if you oh just buy goodness. worm casting. Yeah, it's I mean, when you have a big garden, whoo. Yeah, but you can buy a pound of worms and add them to different beds. And basically, they're going to be producing worm castings the entire summer, summer. And, and the entire growing season. So, so, so yes, like I'm not amendment. saying don't do it, but that would be a situation you could. Absolutely. Um, so uh, Joe from Grow Big TV is asking a question to you. What has been the most beneficial vegetable you've grown? And he's followed you for over 10 years now. Wow. Uh, Grow Big TV has fo followed me for 10 years. Yeah. Wow. Thank you so much. Um, Most beneficial vegetable. And maybe approach it from like your homesteading because you, you are trying to grow your own food and preserve would, what you're what you're. Yeah, growing. I would have to say tomatoes because you can do so many things with tomatoes. And uh, and I've and I have canned a lot of tomatoes. I may, I ate some, Mark Valerie uh, gave me a recipe for his uh, pasta sauce, which I made and canned in August. And I had some last night, it's delicious. So I, I guess benef if you say beneficial, I've probably mostly benefited from tomatoes because I've grown a lot of tomatoes. It's not necessarily, you know, what I um, love the most. I mean, I love watermelon, but that's, hit or miss. And, um, yeah, I, I would agree with you. I think tomatoes, uh, I, I, and I talk a little bit about it in that video on is gardening worth the cost yeah. that as you and I were talking before the show, you know, I spent 30 years saving up and planning to get a greenhouse and I will probably never recoup the costs of that greenhouse. But this last year in November, when I could go in my greenhouse and eat a delicious cherry tomato when there's snow starting to fall outside, oh, it, that's, that, that is the most beneficial plant to grow for me. It's just because the flavor and just having that experience makes it all worthwhile. I, I have something to add and then I have a question. So uh, uh, Randy, who was my helper the last couple of years, uh, dug up, there was one tomato plant, uh, a, a, a um, volunteer that was still, that still looked good when we were taking the, the, uh, the garden down. And I said, just, uh, dig that up and put it in a pot and I'll take it in. Um, and, and I'll, I'll take it in the, uh, garage this winter and see if I can keep it alive. And, uh, I have, I had two little tomatoes last month and there's one little tomato like that that it makes small tomatoes i forget mm -hmm. what it is and uh it's one of those baker creek with the stripey gold stripes and i've got one in there on my counter I, I haven't tried it yet and then i noticed yesterday there's two flowers nice. in february in the garage under under grow lights and 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 the other thing was they have a tendency i don't know where they come from but they get covered in aphids okay did you have that problem with your cherry tomatoes in the greenhouse? Um, no, I haven't had an aphid problem. Um, I had that problem when I was at the school garden and we had a 42-foot greenhouse and Ooh. I would have aphids occasionally in the greenhouse. But the approach I, I take, particularly indoors, is if the aphids are appearing, most often you're going to see ladybugs appearing too. There's a delay. Usually the aphids show up a week or two before the ladybugs. Uh, but every time I would see a ladybug, I would capture it and release it into the greenhouse. And 
that was a, a natural way to take care of the aphid. So I have had when you're when you're growing in an enclosed space like that and the aphids find it, they're going to be a problem. And I like the natural approach of letting ladybugs eat the aphids if I can get away with it. But but I've had to put neem oil on my plants and yeah. uh, you know, have to deal with aphids when there aren't ladybugs yet. Safer soap. Well, uh we have, I don't know if this happens in Colorado, but we have ladybugs that come in by the thousands and get into your house. And they're coming in, every time you open the garage door, they're coming into the garage. So I had, and a lot of them have died by now, but you know, I still have one or two. I mean, they're, and so if I find it in here, I carry it out. <laughs> there you go. But, but it's not enough. I mean, if, no. if aphids get on a plant, there are literally thousands of aphids and yeah uh, and I, I i i consider myself lucky um i showed it in one video i don't remember which video it was a few years ago but i have a bush just outside my my garage it's a it's a wild current that does well here in colorado mm, nice but but it's growing in a spot that's terrible for plants doesn't get enough sun soil is bad and it always struggles and every year that plant gets attacked by thousands of aphids because while everything else is new and young and fresh and healthy, that plant always struggles. And so what's so wonderful, and I've, I've done this on purpose and it actually works, mm -hmm. is you put a stressed plant in your garden and the aphids are going to eat that stressed plant first. Mm -hmm. And then when the ladybugs show up, they're going to go straight to that plant. They're going to explode in population. And so I have very few problems with aphids in the other sections of my garden. Wow. Because by the time the aphids would spread, they've already been uh, overpopulated by the lace wings and the ladybugs and everything else that, that pops up. So If I have lace wings, I have not noticed it. I they're had there. In California, but I just don't see it. I, I know I have them, but I'm lucky if I see one. You know, they're so light and flimsy and they're invisible when they're flying. I and, know. Uh, but, but yeah, they're a wonderful way to. It's one to of get God's of amazing it. little creatures, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And, and so um, at, as you're in your winter, I'm in my winter. Your winter is different than my winter, of course. But as you are planning what your gardening season is going to be looking like and and kind of with that underlying theme that you're doing all the gardening yourself at, in your homestead, I'm doing all the gardening by myself in my large garden. What are some of the, the important things that you're thinking about to make it easier on you? Because I saw a comment early on, the older you get, the harder it is to garden because it just every year is a little bit harder because we're just not as young as we used to be. So what are some of the things you're thinking about going into this new season to make gardening easier for you? Well, two things uh, I have already done or one is engaged to be done. Uh, and one is I had the raised beds built, rebuilt. I was going to say this before about if you're just starting and you're building your raised beds, make sure that you use appropriate wood if you're using wood, because I didn't. And um, the, I used treated for because I, I was reclaiming what was there. And and I used that around the bottom and then I just used cedar around the top, eight inches around the top. Well, all of that's perfect. And everything underneath completely rotted and the sides just bulged out. So everything had to be rebuilt. And since it was being rebuilt, I spent the extra bucks for cedar. And then I added another eight inches around the top. Because as you get older, you just don't want to be on your knees as much. You don't want to be bending down so far. I broke my kneecap this uh, past August oh. just by a freak fall in the garage. You know, just tripping. That's what you do when you get older. You trip. Yeah. And uh, when you're younger, you're just spry and you just jump over everything and it's no big deal. And then if you're not watching every step, you trip, especially on, on a hill. Yeah. You know, if you have a nice, big, flat, open area and you, you've got your 
your beds are all laid out just perfectly like this, 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 you know, where yeah, you're but, but I've got, I've got hoses and I've got a dog that brings big sticks and branches into the yard. Okay. And, and I, I've done that too. I, sure. yeah. I will trip. That's one reason why I've got three to six inches of wood chip mulch in all my paths, because if I do fall, it acts as a cushion. Well, that's what I want to do, but I can't do it because I'm on a hill and every time it rains, they wash off. So if you're, if it's flat, they'll stay put, but mine won't. But anyway, so building the raised beds, not so much bending over. And then, and then a couple of other things is I, um, <laughs> uh, well, I forgot the one for a second, but I bought and never got set up last year, an irrigation system from Haas Tools. So I have a big box of a quarter inch irrigation, which I want to get set up. Irrigation is, is really my hard thing here because I'm so far from the garden. And so I have my cistern water is piped down there. I did that the first year, but it's not connected up. And so I need a system. Once I get my garden laid out, I'll know what I'm growing and where the rows are. But the whole thing's going to be tilled. And so I don't know what I'm going to grow. I'm, I'm going to grow less okra. I'm going to, you know, I've made plans to grow less sweet potatoes, less okra. You know, I just okra coming out my ears and everybody that loves okra grows it here themselves. And it does not stay like if I took it to a market or however you would do that, you know, you need to eat it fresh. Yeah. The day you pick it, you know, have to you eat. pickled okra? I fermented. Okay. But I didn't pickle it. The, uh, I think the very, no I, no, I was pickling green beans. The very first thing that I pickled that wasn't green beans was okra. And okay. uh, I, okra doesn't do well in here in Colorado, so I have mixed success with it. But, uh, but my wife loved pickled okra, and that's a great way to preserve it. I do almost, we talked briefly about this. I'm, I'm almost exclusively fermentation now when I'm, when I'm doing one of those kind of methods. Mm -hmm. um, I don't do a lot of pickling, but have you fermented your okra? Yeah, that's what I did. Okay. I've got it in there. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing I remembered is, is I, this, this is, I've arranged for this. It hasn't happened yet, but I have a big tiller. I, in, in 2021, for whatever reason, we couldn't get some components from uh, Asia. There was a big uh, lag. It, maybe people remember um, you couldn't get, lawnmower parts you couldn't get you know and so i found the last tiller that i could find and it's a big one it's it's a lot for me to handle and okay. uh, too much for me to handle and so uh that's why i have to hire somebody to to do it and this year i have a new friend and this is what's so great about building community it's harder here where i am now that's something i'd like to talk about sure go for uh, it for other people uh <laughs> is it's harder when you move to the country to try to start a homestead. If you're alone and you don't know anybody, you know, it takes time to find like-minded people because a lot of people in the South, they grew up with gardens. Their parents always had gardens and they've just stopped. They don't want to be bothered or they're too tired. They're too old. They're too, you know, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll ask people. I asked a guy at, at Lowe's who was helping me, in the garden section. And, and I said, do you have a garden this year? And he said, no, nah, I'm working three jobs, you know? And so they want to, but they don't have the time because they're, you know, working too much or they're just over it. You know, they just think that they'll always be able to buy it. And so building community is essential. And I talk about this a lot on my channel now. Absolutely. And this, um, this new neighbor, well, yeah from Illinois. They moved down from Illinois like a year or so ago. And so he's got a small tractor and he's going to come over and till my whole garden for free. And nice. instead of having to either wrangle that thing myself or, you know, now the side garden has a fence around it, so I can't get a tractor in there, but the other areas I can. And so um, I mean, I, I'm excited about something. If I, it, no, I just yeah. literally saw, you know, sometimes I just look through, I don't have a TV. So I, I mean, I'm either looking at, you know, um, independent media or, or I'm looking at YouTube shorts or I'm looking at Instagram shorts. And there was an Instagram short. And it reminded me when I first came here, I used silage tarps 
to uh, kill the the crabgrass. You know, my yard is basically weeds that are mowed. You know, sure. manicured weeds is what my mower calls them. Uh, so you have to kill that crabgrass. And so I did silage tarps to, to kill the, the, for the big garden and for the side garden. And uh, so I, they're, they're big and heavy. I can't even lift them. They're folded and put behind the shop. And I thought, I saw this guy and he was going, you know, the, I love the way the YouTube shorts, there's edited so tight and I don't even know how to do that. But anyway, they dropped this silage tarp and they go, it's the end of February. They're dropping a silage tarp. Uh, big, big runners. And, and then they're rolling it back up in April. It says we're rolling it up in April. And then he's tilling, he's tilling it with a little tiller and then he's planting it. And then in June or July, it, the whole thing is zinnias, just like nice. solid. And I'm going, Hey, I started a, uh, a meadow cause I've carved out all these different areas here. And I started a meadow and I did it for two years, but it just the crab grass and all of those grasses just, came back. So I thought, Hey, I'm going to put down the silage tarp. It's the end of February, take it up in April, till it. And so it was zinnia seeds. Last year, zinnias did great here. And then I right. can take for my flower garden, which I had loaded with zinnias and uh, African marigolds last year. I'm going to uh, make my herb garden. See, I've wanted an herb garden since I came here. I have, I bought all these herb seeds from, um, Southern Southern exposure. Southern exposure. Yeah. Yeah. And I and, and I didn't even I didn't even do any of them last year. And so I'm thinking, okay, this is what I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna seed all of these herbs. Now I've already started nice. I've already started black cumin. Have you ever grown that? Uh no, but I'm actually going to do it um this year. I have oh, I have a um uh a package from um survival garden seeds and it okay. includes the black cumin. And I mentioned that in a video I did a few weeks ago. So yeah, that is on my list of, of things that I'll be growing. I've never grown it before, but I've had a number of people comment after that video saying it's great to grow. Well, I, I think I started it last year, but nothing materialized. I'm, I'm not great at, at taking notes and keeping track of everything. And you know, what winds up in April that's, that's lived gets goes in the garden <laughs> and the rest gets forgotten about. But yeah, that and I, I bee bomb I did yesterday. So I've got a bunch of herbs already started, but now I'm going to go into those Southern exposure. There's, there's unusual ones in there that I, I, you know, fever few and all these, you know, really interesting herbs. And so then I, then I have electric to go around the herb garden so I can make sure the deer, so the deer okay. is the biggest problem here. Yeah, I bet. So, so that's a great point. Uh, this year I'm I'm doing all new varieties, plants I've never oh, grown before. That's and, exciting. And I exactly I think it's it's exciting too. And and one of the things as we get older and we start gardening is I don't think you you should lose that excitement. I I've I just know too many gardeners that just do the same thing every single year. They grow the same plants in their same plot. And then they get bored with it and they, they end up not gardening because there's just no excitement anymore. And so I love that, that the Southern Exposure Seed Exchange has a lot of seeds for that you're using that you haven't mm -hmm. done before. And I'm doing the same thing because it doesn't mm -hmm. matter how old we are. We can still have that new excitement. garden experience of excitement. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh, but it's nice to have a little knowledge because even, even sometimes you start, you use a certain starting mix, you get it too wet, you get it, to maybe, maybe the heating mat is too hot. And, you know, one year, everything goes great. Like last year, I had a whole tray of 50, 50 English lavender. Wow. And, and this year I start, I, I cited the same tray and I got nothing. Hmm. Two different seed mixes in half and half. Two different two different seed companies half and half. So I was just like, I don't know. You know, I'm going to try again. But it lavender just takes so long that yeah. I've already called a nursery to see if you know what's going to cost me to get a bunch of plants. <laughs> I'm determined to have lavender here. I, I know they and they can grow lavender in Tennessee. It's not easy though. Yeah, and it's not easy to grow it here in Colorado. But uh, but really? I grow it. 
Uh, yeah, we're well, at least in my region, it's most of the I, lavender, like English lavender. I can't grow English lavender, but I can grow French lavender. And oh. so, um, yeah, it's the, the winters and just the weather here. It's really finicky about what we can grow and get away with. But I have started lavender from seed and do have some in my garden in a couple different areas. And it doesn't grow huge. It basically dies back every winter, but uh, it, it is comes lavender. back. It comes uh, but, back. Yeah, but it does come back. At least if it's in a if it's in a sheltered area, uh, kind of a little microclimate that's a little bit warmer, I can actually grow it outside here. Oh wow. Yeah. So, but it's a challenge. Uh, JK yeah. Gardner's wondering, do you grow in a greenhouse? Uh, hey, JK Gardner, thank you for your question. No, I don't. I because I don't have one, and uh, I'm trying to live within my means, and uh, which isn't usually it is impossible, but I am trying and, you know, to outlay a, how many thousands, thousands and thousands of dollars for a greenhouse that hasn't happened. Yeah. Uh, that's one obstacle. Another obstacle is I'm on a hill. And so the, the very best sun is like right dead in front of my house. And, you know, the, the best thing about this property where I to sell it is the view off my front porch. I don't want to be looking at some, you know, yeah plastic, you know, greenhouse. And so you've got a nice one. It's polycarbonate, carbonate, yeah. right? Yeah. It's the polycarbonate, um, walled panels. So it's got the, the interior space for insulation or the interior air. It's like a, a little, um, yeah. sandwich of air and it polycarbonate is indestructible. But I want one desperately. And so if some, some, uh, Greenhouse company sees this and you want to put one on my property, we'll find a place for it. <laughs> yeah. I wish I I wish I could have found that company that was willing to put it on the property. I know. Because uh, seriously, you know, I I wanted one for so long and it just never fit in the budget. And then I I looked at this as my retirement property. And it's like I'm finally old enough that I can devote the time and attention to my garden and I want a greenhouse and, and by George, you got it. And I got it. You know, it's those little things that, you know, I think we, it's a priority thing and, you know, money that, that people spend at Starbucks or wherever they're going. Those days are over. Over time. And, and, but that's the problem. It's over time and you do have to have a plan in place. But, you know, three or four dollars a day put into a piggy bank over a long period of time. Suddenly you recognize, wow, it's been 10 years that I've been saving this money and I wow. finally have time to do a greenhouse. And, yeah, and that's what it takes for for many of us, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And so I so I suggest you start now. <laughs> exactly. It's too late for me. Ten years from now, I probably won't be gardening. But well, or. I'm 10 years from now, if you are gardening, maybe you'd be ha happy that you had a greenhouse that was warmer and able to do gardening. Well, it was interesting when I first came here, and I haven't heard from him in a while. Um, I met the industrial farmer at the end of the road. I, I won't name na name names, but uh, he was very nice. And the first, first day I met him, he said, well, I have all, you know, he grows tobacco. He grows the usual suspects, tobacco, um, uh, corn and soy. And, um, I think there's one, uh, and now he's into watermelons. It, 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 that's, so he's selling all his watermelons to Kroger and all these places. Anyway, he has all these, to, these, uh, greenhouses, big, long greenhouses that he starts his tobacco plants. And he says, I'm done with that by February. You could, you, you could just use my, you know, and pay me the utilities. And I thought, Wow. I mean, I, when I'm starting seeds here, I'm thinking this is what I love the most. Starting seeds, seeing little seedlings, tending to little seedlings. And then it would be so great to just back, package them up and yeah. sell them, you know, yeah. <laughs> because I grow way There's more, I start way more than I can take care of. Sure. You know, and I, this is, this is a failing of mine, <laughs> but anyway, uh, well, I, I think just, a lot of us do that. A lot of us, we just get, in the moment and we put too many seeds in oh, and yeah. it, it's just habit that we grow more than we can take care of. 
I know, but you know, you, you stop and you think, well, wow, if I could grow all of these, I don't know how many are in here, but let's just say there's 20 or 30, uh, 30 uh, Moringa seeds. Mm -hmm. If I, I was just going to grow like five or six, you know, start five or six and uh, just see what I could get. But then I thought, wow, if I could really grow, then you say to yourself, wow, if I could really grow that out, I might be able to sell those, That's you right. know? Or I might be able to sell the leaves or you, you, you get that going in your head, you know, well, I might be able to. Well, and so uh, my son is, is getting into homesteading and doing a lot with that. He has a number of chickens. In fact, he was just at his first farmer's market this last weekend selling some of his crafts that he makes and his eggs. And so as you are doing your homestead, do you have... Um, chickens or any animals or are you mostly focused? I haven't seen any videos of you doing chickens. No, everybody says, Hey, you got to get chickens. Hey, you got to get chickens. I know that. But uh, I have decided, you know, that I don't want to take on more lives. Oh, sure. It's one thing to take on the life of a plant and it's another thing to take on the life of an animal. And I don't want to take on any more, uh, I don't want to take on livestock unless I had a partner. Okay. Somebody no, that's here per and that was helping sense. me. You know, I was just I I asked the question because that I mean it's not, it may not be a huge income source, but but that's what my son is doing is selling his eggs to help pay for some of the other things that he needs to do on, on the homestead. I mean, so. I frankly don't know how you can it's cost effective to I mean you can buy eggs for like anywhere from four to six dollars a carton. Uh, from home, from home, chi home chickens, and I, I don't even know how that you can cost effective for the feed to sell them for so low. But people won't buy them if they're not low. That's right. They just won't do it. They'll yeah. go, they'll go and buy the factory eggs from the store, you know, for two dollars. Yeah. Before yeah, they're exactly right. Three dollars for something actually healthy. Yeah, it, it, it's not a way to pay your mortgage, but. Uh, if you have the chickens, he's got so many chickens. He loves the chickens. And, oh, and, he, and it is. It's a trade-off. Um, and he's not making a lot of money, but he's just enjoying doing what he's doing. So oh, I, cool. my original plan was to have chickens here. Mm -hmm. And I agree with you. Each year, it becomes more and more challenging to get all the chores done. And taking care of animals is a lot of work. And well, so I've, I've put that on hold as well. The great thing about your place is if you wanted to just cordon off, I mean, I, I don't know if you're in a rectangle or a square. I, I'm not sure. It's a rectangle. It's yeah. rectangle. You could just cordon off a quarter of that one season and just say, I'm just going to do over here. Oh, sure. And then, you know, do that. Yeah. For me, it's just like, I, I say, well, what if this is the last year that I can have a really big garden? I said that last year. Now I'm saying it again this year. What if this is the last year I can have a really big garden? 5,000 square feet down here, uh, 1,200 square feet over here. I don't know. I've got eight, uh, four by eight and six by eight raised That's beds. Over garden here. area. Regular terraces and the orchards. It's just like. <laughs> well, but, but that's, that's important. And, and, you know, I talked about that a little bit in that video of every year you need to reevaluate. And if you can do it, then do it. And if next year is the year, the year after is the year that you say, I just can't do it anymore, then, you know, you've got to make that decision for yourself. And mm -hmm. all of us, I think, should make the decision for ourselves, of course. Uh, but yeah, I do the same thing. It, am I going to grow everything I want to grow in all of my beds this year? Well, of course, I end up buying more seeds than I need. And I almost have to grow in all of the beds because I've got so many seeds. But at some point, and have you thought about this, what that timeline might be? At some point, you really should cut back a little bit. So instead of growing in all of those different areas, have you identified which is your favorite spot and what you will grow in when you start downsizing? Well, last year I cut my tomato terraces loose. I did plant tomatoes there. Uh, my my better tomatoes were in the lower garden. Uh, I, I think I had 35 plants 
around 35 plants down there, maybe 45, I don't know. And then uh, up here, I planted at least 45 plants, but uh, they don't get as, as good a sun and the weeds just consumed them. And I never got them, um, you see up here on the tomato terraces, I designed that area to grow tomatoes on a string from okay. a single string. So you yeah. got to prune and you got to take care of it. You got to maintain. And that did not get done. And, and the tomatoes just got consumed with weeds and the whole thing is just, so that, that, was, that again. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. But now I, uh, this, this man that pruned my fruit trees was telling me that my, I, I planted 20 hazel, but hazelnut bushes in March of 22. Now it's, it's coming up on March of 24. They've not done a thing because they're over there right next to the woods and the deer have just wow. ruined them. Yeah. All the trees have a wire. I have three pecan trees. They're little, but they have a wire cage around it. And then I planted three white, uh, white Eastern pines, Eastern white pines, and they're, di they died $900 investment and they died. Wow. And they were, and they had the thing too, because he told me when he planted them, if you don't put the cage around it, the deer will destroy the the trunk when they when the males when they start rutting. Yeah, they're and so well, their antlers. And the uh, so <laughs> I've tried so many things that have not worked, you know, yeah. and and uh, I, I learned my lesson last year. If it's not deer protected, don't even bother. So I'm still, I still need to get a fence around the orchard. Yeah, I've got trees or I've got fencing around all my fruit trees and I've got bird netting over the tops of the trees too, because as they start poking out of the fence, the, the deer will discover all of those tips. So I have to do that too. It's just one of those things. If you want you take, fruit trees, you got to protect them. Do you take the netting off in the winter? Uh, no, I leave it. No, I leave it on in the winter because that's when they're most active and hungriest, at least in my area. There's, you know, there's nothing. You can see the picture I took this morning. There's nothing growing in Colorado in, in winter, especially late winter and early spring. And so those fruit trees, as they're just starting to bud. Oh, yeah. They're just so delicious to those deer. And there's nothing else growing yet. And uh -oh. so it, it's it's the late winter in particular. I've got to have netting over all the trees, or else the deer will just chew. Oh, all of I the thought trees. I had until March to get my fence up, but I need to have it up now, right? Uh, depends on if if your deer are eating in other places and happy with what they're finding. I'm sure you've got some green growth appearing in forests and in various. Oh, areas. I've got. Well, there's first of all, there's grass. There's yeah. green grass out there, green weeds yeah. and grass and, and all kinds of weeds, you know, from. Yeah, I, I think that's the big difference. If the, deer, if the deer have a diet someplace else with the, you know, they'd rather eat fresh new grass than an old dried tree branch. But I here in Colorado, here in Colorado sometimes the tree branches are all they can get. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I want to give a shout out to, to Brian at Brian's Garden. He gifted five memberships to the Gardner Scott channel. So I look wow. forward to, to seeing the five of you that Brian gave a, a gift of membership to. Brian is just such a great supporter of the channel and is always so giving and often Thank gifts you, Brian. memberships. So that's that's fantastic, Brian. You're, you are a wonderful person helping out. And uh, yeah, Big Will Dog is also noticed that, that uh, doing stuff here. So, and thank you for that big wheel dog. Scott's a good dude and, and fellow airman to me. Yeah. Th th those of us that, that spent time that was that, you know, so, so you were an actor. I was in, uh, had a career in the air force and I just kind of stumbled into the gardening thing as well. I just went to a master gardener class and thought, Oh, this is kind of cool. And before I know it, I've got big gardens and I'm making videos and all kinds of other things. You just what, never know what's going to bring you into gardening. What year did you start the making videos? So I, I made my first video, I think in 2009, but I just did a handful of videos, uh, just more documenting. I, I became a master gardener in 2004. So I just, 
made a couple videos just to document what I was doing with that garden that I lived in at the time. Mm -hmm. And then I didn't make videos again for like five or six years. And then I made okay. a couple videos. And so it was really uh, about the 2006 time frame. And that's when I discovered your channel. And I really started thinking that I wanted to to show others. I, I, I worked at a school garden, a huge school garden, 24,000 square feet of space, 100 raised beds, 42 foot greenhouse. And I, I had to build it from scratch. And, what kind of school has a uh, budget for that? We didn't have a budget for it. So not only did I have to build it, but I had to come up with the funding for it as well. Oh my gosh. So it, it, was a, it was a major endeavor, but it was hugely successful. And a lot of donations, a lot of, of volunteers, but even as a master gardener, and I'd been teaching public classes for years, I didn't know nearly enough what I needed to know to start a garden that big from scratch and all the funding and the ways to save money. And that's when I discovered you because it's like, oh, I'll just check YouTube and see what YouTube is telling My me. Is big. And well, but the basic ideas of how to do some things what I recognized was there's, and you, I'm sure many of us agree with this, there's just so much garbage on YouTube, the information that's wrong, that doesn't fit with the way we really need to do it. And that's what got me started making videos is I just recognized that there needed to be good information. And I watched channels, you know, particularly with yours that were so professionally produced all those years ago. It's like, yeah, that's what I want to do. I want to have good videos with good information. And you've evolved. We've both evolved. But you now are more of the, here I am. This is what I'm doing. This is my property. I'm going to show you this thing. And and here are the challenges. The challenges. And it's a, it's a new audience. It, I'm sure that there aren't many people from your little plot in LA that are watching you in Tennessee now, but that's, I think that's a good thing because the people that are watching you now probably have more of that lifestyle and they really do need to hear, this is what I'm going through. These are the decisions I'm making and this is how difficult it is. Well, it's interesting because Mark, I believe he's still on. Brian's garden is here. He's followed me for, from the very beginning. Uh, but I asked Mark, I, or I, we tried to kind of talk about that. I was wondering if, if it was just a legacy, uh, a, a legacy feeling uh, to, to follow me over to this since he has an urban gar more of an urban garden setting. And, and is, it, is it just out of fondness for me? Is he following now or, or is he really learning stuff now? You know, and so I don't. I don't know. I, I know I do hear from a lot of, uh, particularly women, some men that uh, are doing it on their own and are inspired by my efforts. Yeah, good. To try to do it on my own. You know, although I mean, admittedly, I I have to get help. You know, all the time. Thank you, Jay. Yeah, and for those of you who might just be joining us or have been trying to follow along, Kate Cottrell has her own YouTube channel. It's the K. Cottrell Late Bloomer channel, and it's got um, 15 years of videos plus everything from growing in the city landscape on a small plot to now how to preserve foods, how to plan, how to make those decisions on a much larger plot. So definitely check out K's channel. And I have it also in the link in the description below. You can check out K's channel and, and see her journey. And, uh, and, and I think it is a good journey. I always look at gardening as a journey and, and we're not staying in the same place. We are moving. I've had, let's see, in the last 20 years since I became a master gardener, I've lived in, um, four different locations and each time had to start a garden from scratch and moved plants from one garden to the next garden and each one was in a completely different area with completely different soil and completely different problems. And I'm not saying I'm not encouraging people to move just to learn new gardening stuff. Mm -hmm. But when you do move and as you get older and get more experience, I think it's beneficial to actually have to overcome some of those problems. 
Well, I just feel like um, well, the, the something that I've experienced here and moving to the country. And I mean, I, I'm like a mile and a half from the highway, but it is, it's not, I don't live in town. It's definitely the country. Uh, is that I don't want to go out. I can't get a meal out anywhere around here that I can, that is the quality of food that I can get out of my kitchen mm -hmm. that I've grown myself. And it, it, it's just unbeatable. I mean, two days ago, I have my neighbor, my neighbor texted me and she said, would you like a fresh loaf of sourdough bread? <laughs> I said, yeah. <laughs> and she said, I'll be right down. And she drives it down here and delivers it to me. And, uh, you know, and it was so good. And, and so, uh, I just feel like your, your life ben is so benefited by, by controlling what you, you know, you know, what's going into your food when you grow it yeah. yourself. And there's, there's certain things that are out of your control. We can only control so much. We can't control, you know, what's in the air or whatever. Uh, we can filter our water for the, for the garden. If you have a big enough filtration system and all that, if you're using city water, most people are, let's face it. Most people sure. are watering their garden with city water. So you want to try to filter that because uh, all city water, all city water has a disinf what they call a disinfectant, which is chlorine or chloramine. That is to kill the, uh, the germs and all of that bacteria. Uh, and, and then they add all this other stuff too. So some places, uh, add flor fluoride and some places don't. Uh, and I always encourage everybody to call up their water department and find out if they're putting fluoride in the water where they are, because that's the hardest thing I've been told. That's the hardest thing to get out of water is that chemical is, is the hardest thing to get out. And so uh, the, 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 I learned this the first year of gardening is that this, the uh, tap water uh, uh, kills the biodiversity in the soil. So you always try and have to put that back in with fish fertilizer and this thing and, and my, my, mycorrhizae, I always say that the wrong way, mycorrhizae and all of that stuff. I learned about mycorrhizae and, and um, all of that you know, the, like the first year of gardening, that was really exciting stuff to learn that. And, yeah. and, um, you filter it as best you can. And then, uh, if you have your own water source, you know, then, then it's a whole other thing. You know, if you have your own spring and the water's good, that's great. It's the best, best you can get, you know? And, um, I've got mine stored in a cistern, which is uh rain catchment. I did rain catchment in California when I, when I just, we, it rained like only like five times a year, you know, it, it never rained from the entire summer season from like wow. April till September. It, it would never rain one single time. Can you imagine going all summer with no rain? Oh yes, I can. That happens often here. Oh, it does? <laughs> yeah. In Colorado? Oh yeah. Yeah. On the, Why is the so on the East side, because I'm at 7,500 foot elevation and we are, uh, until just recently have been in severe drought situations. So uh, it's a high desert kind of area without a lot of natural rain. Thunderstorms during the summer will bring rain, but if the thunderstorm doesn't roll over your area, then you're not getting the rain here in Colorado. Do you, do you try to practice rain catchment? And so it, yes, sort of. So it's actually, until just a couple years ago, it was illegal to collect rainwater here in Colorado. Who made that illegal? I don't understand that. Well, it's because uh, the Colorado River flows to Los Angeles and all of the states in between. And so 100, yes, year, 100 years ago, the the water rights laws that were passed in Colorado basically sold the rights of the water to people downstream unless yes, you already had water. And so in just the last couple of years, we are now able to collect two 50 gallon barrels of water uh, without breaking any laws. But what we can do, and this is where water containment becomes a much broader area, I can direct the downspouts of my house into my garden beds. So as long as I'm not collecting the water, then it's 
going through the soil into the aquifers or evaporating into the clouds and then falling into the lakes and rivers. And that water, which is already spoken for, finds its way to its source. But I have to dir direct it into my gardens. But it goes there anyway. Well, sure, but <laughs> I didn't write the laws. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we hold it here in a gal. We hold it here in a container for for three months, and then it goes there. Or we can just go make it go straight there. It's, it's all the same difference. Yeah, yeah, but, but that's that's maybe, what we have to deal it's with not here. The same difference because maybe it has to go when the I don't know when the waters. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the idea is that the rainfall has to reach the ground. That's basically the the way the laws are. You can't stop the rain from hitting the ground or you can't stop the snow from falling on the ground so that it reaches the the tributaries do you enjoy river. living at 7500 square feet uh 7500 feet ele elevation yeah you do okay yeah, yeah it's a little bit closer to 7000 um and, but uh the, the last well, i did have a garden two gardens ago we were just over 7500 feet and it's just a few miles up the road and now i'm just a few a little bit more than 7000 feet but uh, yeah, it's a cha challenging environment here. And do that, does that school where you develop this huge garden, is it still in working? It, uh, so yes and no, it's in Colorado Springs. Uh, and it is still in place and there, it's still operating. And um, the students are still using the garden. Um, it's, it's not as big and robust as when I was working it, but, but it is still operational. But the school district is talking about um, closing that school just because of the the way that the, the students are. It, it's an older neighborhood now, so there aren't kids there anymore. It's, oh. a, it's a bunch of old people. So uh, yeah. the kids are moving into do new areas with new schools. So that school may close. But I'm retired from all of that, and it's kind of sad to see. So I don't vision visiting as much as I used to be. Somebody but, like you, but younger, should take that over and, and, and make a big nursery there. Yeah, there you go. That's a possibility. Yeah, and so. sell plants. And, and you know, but it's a lot of work. That was one of the things, um, because we didn't have any budget from the school district, that was a huge moneymaker for us is uh, a plant sale. So yeah. I, I got real good at growing plants because I would grow – a thousand tomatoes and 500 peppers and 500 yeah. herb plant. I'd grow thousands of plants in the classroom with the help of the students each year. And then we would sell them uh, at, as a fundraiser in the, in the spring for, for planting. And it can be done. One person with a little bit of help can grow thousands of plants. It's just a lot of work. Yeah, I, I could see myself doing that. Yeah easily just with maybe one helper, you know, but, but, uh, having the sale, you know, uh, bringing in the community, knowing the people, I mean, you, because you have a school, you have a lot of people vested in it. And sure. so they're going to want to support that. Yeah. And, and I had a lot of partners throughout the city, mm -hmm. um, that helped. And so we'd get the word out and, and mm -hmm. it would always be a big success. And, and that is a, big aspect. You have to have that network because if you just, you know, go to your, your friend down the street and start growing plants in the greenhouse, then what? You've got to have that network to actually be able to sell those plants. Exactly. There's a guy down my road, uh, Ricky, and uh, he has a, a, a beautiful shop building. And then he built a little greenhouse that you just walk, walk out one of the walls of the shop and the greenhouse is right there and it gets really good sun. He starts all his seeds there. So he set, he sells organic seedlings uh, every year, but he's got a sign out here. And he told me that the first year I bought from him, cause I didn't have any cabbage started. Uh, he said he had sold like made $2,000 or something like that. He said, but his wife has this Facebook page and she just puts the word out on the Facebook and they all come and get, you know. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, but, social you know, media is a, a good he, thing. He grew up here, so he know, you know, they know everybody. That's different. I don't know any, you know, I know like five people here. <laughs> well, there you're getting there. You're I'm getting, getting there. there. Yeah. 
And so uh, we're as we're closing in towards the end of the show, um, what would be the, and I'll say best advice, but more importantly, your advice that you would give to gardeners who are, or people who aren't even necessarily gardeners yet. They're, they're in a career, they're working, they're looking towards retirement. They're trying to figure out what they're going to do later in life. And they kind of think maybe gardening would be something that would interest them. And so as you look over the, these these last 15 years in particular that you've really focused more on gardening, uh, what, what advice would you give to someone who is trying to make that transition, figuring out what they're going to do as a late bloomer? Well, I think uh, the benefits, focus on the benefits. So for, first of all, uh, you're going to have food that you know what's in it and you enjoy eating it. You grow what you grow, what you love. Uh, the community that you're going to, um, you're going to connect with, if you're in the city, you're going to connect with, uh, an, in an, an urban, you're going to connect with neighbors and, and, you know, just retiring and sitting and watching TV and not doing anything, uh, is, is very sedentary. It's, uh, gardening is great exercise. Uh, depending on how big your garden is and how, how big your aspiration is. But uh, I just think it's inspirational and, um, and, you know, even if you live, for example, I used to, <laughs> I used to tell myself, cause I lived in Manhattan for seven years and I used to tell myself, I never thought I would leave, but then I went to LA to try, you know, to try to get some more acting work and then, you know, uh, had my son out there. So, uh, then it was all about raising a family and, and staying put. But, but even if you're in a, in a city, you know, you can be growing and, and it was a lost opportunity for me. Sure. Uh, it, you can be growing microgreens in your, in your kitchen. You know, um, you can, you can do that anywhere, anywhere. Uh, even if you don't have a window, you can have a little grow light and you can be growing microgreens, fresh microgreens, you know, fresh broccoli sprouts are probably the healthiest thing you could eat, you know? And so for, for good health, exercise, community, well-being, um, your, your mental state of mind, keeping you feeling young, there's all the reasons in the world why uh, gardening should be important after you retire or transitioning into, <laughs> Mark says it's a hobby you can eat. Absolutely. Yeah. But I, I just, I just think that every time you see a seed sprout, it's just so amazing. Oh, and yeah. every time you see a butterfly, if, if you, if you grow a flower and then a butterfly decides to grace it with their presence, it, it's so inspirational and so exciting. And you can share that excitement with other people. And we can have this, you know, we got a, so away from the family farm, you know, thinking women have to have careers and we, we've got to be working, working, working. Well, well, what we found out, you know, by sort of breaking up the nuclear family with the mother staying home and taking care of the kids with the husband, you know, you used to, the husband could, could provide enough to raise a family of six, four, four kids, six, and go on a vacation every summer. Now you've got both parents working three jobs to try to pay, just pay the expenses. Everybody's stressed to the max. One of the great things about gardening is, and I forget if it's endorphins or serotonin or which, which chemical. It's all of it. It's all of it. You get your hands in the dirt yeah. and you start, it, it lifts your spirits, you yeah. know? And so we're in a very stressful time in our world. And I don't think you can really divorce uh, yourself uh, from, from the, that reality. And I think gardening is uh, it's a hobby you can eat. You know, it's, it's a perfect, it's a perfect line, you know um, it's just, yeah. it's a total win-win and take it as far as you can afford to take it, share it with as many people as you can. You can feed other people. If you have excess. <laughs> Just want to say that Amy's saying that first podcast they've watched and they learned a lot and now it's time to get out in the garden. That's right. That's right. 
No, I, I totally agree with you. I, and I think you're, that as you began, that was important. Focus on the positive. The, you know, leaving the corporate world, or in my case, the military world, where everything is just so stressful, and mm -hmm. initially things aren't going to go right in gardening, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be tough. There's going to be problems. There's going to be a lot of failures. And if you can get past that and not look at it as a failure, but look at it as a learning experience, an opportunity to, to do better next time, and then start all the stuff you said, the health, the, the, the chemical increase in your body that makes you feel good, the food that you can eat and share all of that. Absolutely. You're, you're spot mm -hmm. on with it all. If you, if you, are you familiar with Wendell Berry? A little bit. Yeah. And so Wendell Berry, uh, I read in one of his books, he said that gardening is, let's see, um, gardening is, or, or farming. It, it, he, he was a farmer. So right. I, I can't remember if he said gardening or farming, but it's all the same thing. It's just on a different scale. Right. right. Uh, gardening is the education of a lifetime because you learn about soil. You learn about biodiversity. You learn about insects. You learn about pests. You learn about diseases. You, you get produce you can eat. You can, it, it's just, there's so many layers uh, of, of yep. learning. You never, you never stop learning. You learn something all the time. Yeah. And have fun with it. You're, you're talking about yeah. butterflies. And I, two years ago, there was, there was a bee in my squash flowers, actually a number of bees, but a, one bee in particular, it was a male flower. And I seriously spent 25 minutes watching this bee because it wasn't flying from flower to flower. It got in that flower and spent 25 minutes just going in circles, climbing up the stamen. It went from just a bee to a bee coated with pollen. And then by the time it got ready to leave, it, it couldn't take off. It was so <laughs> overloaded that it had to climb up on the pedal and, and was like shaking off the pollen so that it could air, get airborne. And, and you just, you can't see that if you just are scrolling through social media generally. You, it, it's not the same. You have to be there and watch it happen. And I'll never forget that bee that, that was so fat with pollen that, that he couldn't fly or she they couldn't can, fly. They can carry the, their weight in pollen. Yeah. Their entire weight. It's, can you imagine if, it, <laughs> I'm trying to imagine that. Okay, yeah. say we had wings and say, <laughs> and say we had, say we weighed 130 pounds and we had wings. Okay. Yeah. I, I don't weigh 130. I wish I weighed 130. Anyway, you had wings and then you're carrying 130 pounds on your back and you're going to fly. Yeah. That's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. It's a bad thing. I, it's just, I just want it's, it's fun. That's why I get out in the garden is to see. Stuff and, like and I had this experience, you know, right. The very first year I started, which was 2012, actually. Um, so I'm coming up on my 12th anniversary, just FYI. And the very first year I met a woman. Can't remember where I met her now, but she was a citizen. She, she called herself a citizen scientist. So you can become a citizen scientist. And uh, observe the monarch. You know, the monarch has been terribly depleted by the, mm -hmm. by the millions and millions uh, from mainly months, you know, uh, Roundup and all that uh, sprayed, sprayed against the weeds. Because, you know, when, when they use Roundup on the, on the industrial agriculture, you'll see a whole field and there won't be one weed. Right. And so... Uh, these these migratory insects like the monarch would would migrate to Mexico and they would stop in the fields and they would eat the the uh, the wild um, <laughs> milkweed milkweed because they they only eat they only eat milkweed and they only lay their eggs on milkweed so if they can't find milkweed they don't live it ends and it, it ends and i learned all of this my first year by by meeting this woman who's a citizen scientist and she she was raising the monarchs and she they were all in her house and they're crawling all over 
<laughs> wasn't that much, but I mean, yeah, she said this. Sometimes they get in the bedroom and, you know, so, <laughs> and, um, but I learned so much from that. And, and that launched this whole interest for me in, in the monarch. And, and I grew milkweed and I raised them and I watched them hatch. And I have a whole series on the monarch on nice. uh, my playlist. But here, I am, I, it's hard to even see one or two a, a whole year. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't seen a monarch in years, um, but I still grow milkweed just in case they, that's in case. they discover it. So, well, Kay, I want to thank you so much for, for being here today and for anyone that is, is just now catching up with the show and joining us late, uh, check out the Kay Cottrell late bloomer channel. I've got it in a link below and you can find some links that Jay has posted in the comments. Thank you, uh, Jay. Just, just been fantastic to chat with you about gardening. I want you to come and do one. I got to learn how to do the software, but I want you to come and do it. Just say you'll do it. Come and do one for me. I will definitely do one with you. In fact, when you when you look at uh, like Tony from Simplify Gardening, and I know you know Tony. And I'll be Neil. doing Tony also. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Joe you, from Grow Big TV. So there's there's a number of, of these channels that I have um, uh, been a guest on their show. So I would gladly come and be a guest on your show when you get to that point. <laughs> they, use Darryl, this as motivation. Daryl is my friend. He just put that comment up there. Every time you see a, a yeah. farmer or a gardener say, thank you for your service. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you for your service to all of us who have seen your videos and are looking thank forward so to- I really appreciate it. To more videos and for all of you um be sure and check out Kay's channel and and see it from a, a slightly different perspective than you might be familiar with and i think that's so important that all of us look at other gardeners and how they do it because like you said every day we can learn something and every gardener has something to teach D uh, uh, gardener scott let me just ask you real quickly we didn't talk about this but are you doing medicinal plants so I am. I just did a video on this a couple of weeks ago. And so this year I am going to, well, yes, I am growing medicinal plants, but this year I'm growing more plants for the purpose of using them medicinally. And okay. so I've been growing these plants for years, but haven't necessarily taken that next step. And so uh, I talk about that in that recent video that this year, I'm going to be growing medicinal plants. I'll be making videos about how to use some of the medicinal plants. Do you plants. have medicinal wild weeds coming up in your garden? I, I do have a few, yeah. Okay. And then I have others that I have intentionally planted. Aha, uh -huh. okay. So, yes, a lot more to come. And now yes, I'm so I'm looking much. forward. And I'm learning a lot about it as I do something new. Me too. Uh, Me too. Coming. You know, it's, it's hard for us when we do a video, we, we act like, you know, we do a video about something. We're not necessarily an expert. We're just, we're learning too. Yeah, absolutely. You know? Well, Kay, thank you so much. And thank you, um, thank you to right. all the viewers who, who have been watching and, and it was a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay. So, uh, wasn't that fun? So, so Kate Cottrell, as I've mentioned a couple of times, check out her channel in the link below. Lots of good information that goes back a lot of years, but a lot of different perspectives on gardening. And I encourage you to check out uh, some of what she has to say. Uh, before we end, I wanna give a shout out to Alan and Amy. I was walking through the supermarket this last week and behind me I hear, Gardener Scott, good morning. And I've told you this before, I love it when people come up and say hello. And I, I appreciate that. So we stood there and talked a little bit in the middle of the store. And they told me about their efforts trying to grow in our challenging Colorado environment. And I was glad that I could help them on that journey. And I was even more glad that they stopped to say hello. So I'll say it again. I said it before. If, if you see me out there and I'll be doing some traveling over the course of the spring and the fall, wherever I'm at, if you see me, stop, say hello, and we'll chat about gardening. Because like you just saw over the last 90 minutes, what could be better than to have another gardener that you can just talk gardening with? I hope that's how you can start this gardening week. I hope you have some opportunities like that in the days ahead. And I will be back next Monday to do this all again at the same time and focus on yet another gardening topic. Thank you to all. And of course, as always, Enjoy.
gardening.